Friday, everyone. John Lorden here with an episode of Brain Scratch. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Just a quick reminder that next week we celebrate Thanksgiving here in the United States, so we will not have a Brain Scratch next week, but we will still have a case cracked and an episode of Searchlight for you guys. So today's case is a real tough one. We have a mother that is looking for justice for over 19 years at this point for the murder of her 15-year-old son. We have a very unfortunate twist that happens in terms of the investigation, and it seems to be a twist that we're talking about on the channel a lot this year. We had a lot of cases that that have this same dynamic working. Uh, we'll hit more about that as we get to it. But today we are looking into the case of Tony Drumright, and here is a picture of young Tony. Uh, this case takes place in Mackenzie, Tennessee. Mackenzie is a city at the tripoint of Carroll, Henry, and Weekly counties in Tennessee, the United States. The population was 5,310 at the 2010 census. So we're talking about pretty small community, uh, which also raises a big question in terms of for persons of interest, we're looking at a pretty small pool unless we're considering that this was someone that wasn't actually living in the area. But then we're also considering that we have police resources for um, you know, a much smaller population as well. Mackenzie has a total area of only 6.3 square miles. And before I get started on today's case, I'm thankful that I get to present information to you from Dennis Ferrier. Uh, I've talked about him on the channel a bit before. He's one of what I consider the last really good journalists out there. He really digs into his stories. Uh, the first link in the description box below under sources, I'm going to have a link to this article. We're going to lean pretty heavily on this article, but he also has a video segment included with it. If you guys don't check anything else out about this case except one other thing outside of this video, please go to that link. Please check that video segment. I really think it'll help bring some more light to the case for you uh, as we go through it. But let's go ahead and get started. And once again, just a big thank you to Dennis for doing such amazing work. Tony Drumright had a heartbreaking start. He wasn't loved as a baby. Instead, he was nearly killed. Tony had been taken by his feet and beaten into a wall like a rug. He was totally paralyzed, adopted mother Becky Drumright explained. He started to walk at 18 months, but he was blind in one eye and that vision never came back. Becky Drumright knew she had to step in, so she adopted Tony. She had him fitted with a glass eye and showered him with love. I wish the story could end there because uh, this young man already had such tragedy to overcome very early in his life and thankfully, this wonderful woman, Becky, helped bring him into a family, helped him move forward from that, and gave him, by what the accounts are saying, a relatively normal upbringing, and he had some awesome goals for himself as well. Let's go ahead and continue with an article over at Tennessee Missing and Unsolved, actually a post from Facebook. Uh, Tony Drumright was a normal 15-year-old boy who liked riding four-wheelers and having his friends over on Friday nights. He loved computer games and had dreams of eventually becoming a computer programmer. He was described as being a genuinely happy and kind person. Uh, other things I've read also say that he really just loved being at home. He really was a bit of a homebody and enjoyed uh, being there. Let's continue back at the article written by Dennis Ferrier. Uh, August 25th, 1999. When Tony's mom and dad come home from work, they could not find him and noticed the family gun was missing. Now, there's also a Nancy Grace uh, podcast that has been done about this. I'll have a link to that in the description box below as well. Uh, it's been combined with um, some Bill Cosby stuff. So if you just jump into the podcast about 35 minutes or so, you should hit the start of where we're talking about Tony's case. His mom is interviewed there and she gives much more detail into what actually happened when she got home that day. She said it was very normal for her to wind up at home and just call out to him, and he was always there. She did that, and he didn't reply. Uh, she was worried. Her husband came home. She told him that she was worried. He kind of replied, oh, you know, you're always 
Uh, you're always on the kid, give him a break. He's probably just out doing something, maybe riding the four wheeler. Uh, she then says that she went to use the phone and she noticed that the phone line wasn't working. So she went and started checking the phones in the house. She got to a back room and the phone was off the hook. In this room was also broken glass. One of the windows had been broken. So she called for Tony's dad. He came running back there and then he got really upset when he noticed that there was a bullet hole in a wall there. And it's been described in some articles as being in a closet. Um, but regardless, his father sees the bullet hole. Then I believe he notices that the family gun is missing and everyone gets concerned. Uh, here's a quote back from the article. My husband was in anguish. Oh my God, he said, oh my God, he has got the gun, drum right, remembered. Then they go outside and apparently she goes out to the front and starts looking. He goes out into the back and starts looking. And then, this is a quote from her again, I heard Henry call me in a blood curdling way. I will never forget it. Tony's dad found him face down behind the house by the air conditioning unit with a bullet wound in the back of his head. Police believed Tony had killed himself. Now, um, this is interesting. There is a gun that is at his feet. He is face down. And it appears that police assumed that the wound on the back of his head was an exit wound when they first saw it. However, I don't know when they arrived because according to what his mom says, he was still alive. Tony was still alive when he was found. So I believe they would probably have called emergency services. Emergency services is going to show up. Are they really going to let police kind of analyze the scene before they take him off and take him to the hospital and try to get him help? I don't believe so. I think that they're probably going to be acting as soon as possible to get him to the hospital. And essentially, the story his mother tells on the Nancy Grace podcast is just that. They go to the hospital, they follow him there, and basically as she's entering the hospital, her husband tells her that unfortunately Tony uh, hasn't made it. So there's a strange thing that happens here because I don't know where the initial assumption that he could have killed himself. I don't know where that's even coming from. Um, I just I don't think police would have had enough time to evaluate what has happened there, which makes kind of what happens next even more baffling in some way. But let's continue with the article. The Carroll County Sheriff had never considered it a crime scene or even placed yellow tape on the scene. So here's that dynamic I was talking about at the start of this video. Um, essentially, they're assuming that he killed himself. And because of that, a homicide investigation does not start. But what's worse than that is uh, essentially all of the evidence that could be collected uh, essentially gets destroyed because the friends come over thinking that they're doing something good to help the family and start cleaning up the scene. Now, another interesting aspect that his mother mentioned on the podcast was that um, she, she, I don't know if she saw the wound. All she described seeing was very little blood on the front of him. She's, I think she described it as two specks of blood on his glasses and then two specks of blood either on his shoe or on his, on his leg. Um, so it's kind of interesting to me that we're talking about, first of all, a wound where somehow police are making the incorrect assumption about how the wound happened. Uh, we have no description about where the bullet actually wound up. I don't know if it's the same bullet that travels into the house that winds up in the wall. I kind of don't think so. And Dennis also pretty much comes to the conclusion that uh, there was a separate shooting that happened in the house and that's where that bullet came from. But I don't really have information to help support that because I haven't heard anything about the trajectory of the bullet outside. If he was laying down when he was shot, it's possible that it could have exited through his mouth. Maybe that's why there was no proper exit wound that could be easily identified. Um, but that's that's kind of part of the mystery of this whole thing. There's just, we're getting some details, but we're not given enough details to really understand where these conclusions are coming from. But clearly, according to the story, their assumption, the police's initial assumption was wrong. It was determined that the shot in the house and the bullet wound in the back of his head was an entrance wound. 
Uh, I don't think that necessarily negates the possibility that it could have been the same bullet. But once again, I, I mean, just looking at the scene, it could be that it's just, it logically defies that thought. I just don't know enough about where he's found. Here's a picture of outside. Uh, it's noted that he was found near the air conditioning unit. You can see that in the photo here. Um, I just don't know what the path of travel is. I don't know if that's the window that got broken. That's right there. Obviously, this is a picture taken from footage that was done at a later time, so the window has been replaced. Um, I'm just trying to give it to you guys as straight as I can in terms of understanding the logistics that are going on here. Uh, Drumright says Tony was shot in the head while running for his life. Now the sheriff brought out the yellow crime tape. So essentially, as she describes it, the next day, all of a sudden she sees that there's a deputy out in front of her house and he is setting up yellow crime tape. They have no idea what's going on. She goes out there and she's like, what's going on? And she said, well, you should go talk to the sheriff. He's in your backyard. She goes back there and he says, well, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that he didn't do this to himself. The bad news is someone did it to him. Um, Maybe not the most sensitive way of putting that, but shes I've heard her quoted several times as saying that that's how it came out. But now there was no crime scene to be investigated. Like I mentioned, Karen, caring friends cleaned up the crime scene while the drum rights were at the hospital. On top of that, keep in mind, we have the firearm. The gun was literally at his feet. We know that it was a gun from the house. It was considered the family's gun. Uh, so what about that? We, sh we should be able to lift prints, right? Well, once again, according to his mother, a friend in law enforcement told the family the murder weapon had also been compromised. And here's a quote from her. That's why there are no fingerprints, because Barney Fife at the damn sheriff's department handled the gun, Drumright said. Now, as frustrating as that is, and considering that this happened back in 19, 1999, I totally get that. But even if the weapon had been compromised in terms of prints, if they would have locked it down and kept it in evidence appropriately, they might have been able to do some analysis for touch DNA at this point. And you could basically omit finding um, the person who touched it. So, you know, if they find three DNA profiles, they say, well, the father was one of them. We know it was his gun. Uh, we've got this other one where we know it's a person that was working at the sheriff's office and they're probably the one that touched it. And then we've got this third one we don't know. Now you would be able to kind of drill it down and say, well, we've got something to work off of here. Unfortunately, I'm not seeing any information about how the gun was handled. I don't know if it was returned to the family. I'm kind of thinking that that might have happened or if it is an evidence lockup and maybe there's still some possibility for them to do that type of analysis. Becky could not get past the murder. Her husband couldn't bear to talk about it anymore. She lost her marriage and even lost her relationship with her daughter for a decade. It's been 20 years. It destroyed my family, I can tell you that, Drumright said. I checked myself into a mental hospital. I just couldn't take it. Really, really tough. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I'd like you guys to watch the video if you have some extra time after this, just to see it come from her own mouth. Uh, and there's something that really kind of bothers me right off the bat. When I started looking into this case, I've seen similar cases to this, typically more with missing persons, but when things seem this kind of close to home, I'm always suspicious about who else was there, you know, who else was in the home, what could have happened around this. Now, as this story is described, the father and the mother seem to get home. I don't know if they get home at the exactly the same time. I don't know if she gets home first, but it seems like the way she's retelling this, that she is extremely confident that uh, her husband was not there before her. Uh, I'm kind of making an assumption there. She doesn't come right out and say that, but just the way that she's retelling this story over and over, it seems like they get home at about the same time. Uh, but it is interesting to know that there is another family member. There is a sister. We have no information about the sister. I, I've seen a few photos of her in that same video segment. She seems to be a few years older. Um, there's, there's definitely nothing that we have in terms of being able to even pontificate or suggest that the sister might have been able to do something in this case. I'm just trying to note who else could have potentially been home because 
the thought that this was an outside perpetrator kind of bothers me a little bit considering the fact that this is the family's weapon. Uh, I'm not saying it's impossible. It could be that the person was there to rob the home, maybe had taken the gun, was going to take some other things. Perhaps Tony came home, found him in the act, and that's what happened. Um, but then to shoot Tony and to leave the gun behind, knowing that you likely left fingerprints or other type of evidence on it is really, really sloppy. So this definitely wouldn't be a professional home invader or someone that had a, a really lengthy experience with it. Um, I don't know. We'll get to some theories by the end of this video uh, directly from his mother about who could be involved with that. But I just wanted to touch on it because in many of these cases, despite the fact that the family says there's some type of outside boogeyman, sometimes we find out that that isn't true and it actually winds up being one of the family members that has done something here. I'm not saying that's the case here and I'm telling you guys, I have nothing near uh, enough information to even evaluate that. But I did want to tell you guys that I, I at least thought about it. I tried to consider it. I tried to look for information. It's just not available. Honestly, there's not a ton of press available on this case. And I'm really happy that Dennis has picked it up, has tried to run with it, that Nancy Grace has done a segment on it. And another writer that I really appreciate, Lee Egan, has also covered this. We're going to touch on her article a little bit later as well. Um, so it seems like there's a good community trying to raise awareness to this. Uh, in terms of YouTube videos, there's a couple of new segments, but I think I'm going to be the first one in the YouTube space to even talk about this case as well. Obviously, we're doing this because we want to raise more exposure to this case. We want someone to call in that tip that can help solve this. According to Dennis at the end of his video segment, two people have already contacted uh, or called in tips saying specifically who has done this. Dennis seems to be of the mind that uh, they might know who the culprit is. They just don't have the evidence to actually do anything about it. So if you're out there and you think you have a piece of this puzzle that could help with this case, please use the contact information down below. There's also a number specifically for the DA's office. They're willing to take anonymous tips. So if you want to keep your name out of it, you can absolutely do that. Uh, the DA does some interesting things in this case. We're going to get to that here pretty soon, but let's continue. I did find one other article, uh, courtesy of the Wayback Machine, uh, from February 2002. We could see at that point a reward was put together for $5,000 for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person, respons the person responsible for the shooting death of Tony Drumright. And it states that Tony's life was cut short at the place he felt most loved, comfortable, and secure at his home. There are blue ribbons placed throughout the McKenzie community to help bring awareness to the community that the killer of Tony Drumright has not been brought to justice and to signify that those who love Tony are agonized every day by his tragic death. It is also a desperate plea for anyone remotely connected to the case to come forward with information. And essentially, we have the years start rolling by. We heard from Tony's mother. Uh, her relationship is strained. She winds up divorced, goes through a period of 10 years of not talking to her daughter. Seems like that has been repaired at this point. But th all through that, she is constantly reaching out. She's, she explained it as she talked to anyone that would listen and was trying to get people to help her solve this case. Uh, it's a case that just was miscategorized for one day, but that one day slip messed things up so badly that she's just needed help ever since. Thankfully, after years, we're talking like 15 years, we get a significant turn in terms of some help finally coming her way. November 4th, 2014, this is from the Jackson Sun. DA to exhume body in Carroll County cold case. More than 15 years after his murder, the body of McKenzie teenager Tony Drumright will be exhumed. District Attorney Matt Stowe of the 24th Judicial District said he will look into the cold case in hopes of finding more evidence. Continuing with another article at Jackson Sun just a few days later, District Attorney Matt Stowe for the 24th Judicial District officially reopened the case Friday morning and after a group of Drumright's close friends and family said a prayer for her son at his gravesite, his body was exhumed from Carroll Memorial Gardens. 
Stowe said Tony Drumright's body will be sent to a lab in Memphis. Uh, there was a press conference. I'm going to have a link to that down below as well. In that, the district attorney does state that it's weird because originally it sounds like he's saying that there's some concern about the state of the body. Uh, of course, there should be. We're talking about 15 years later. But he does say the casket is intact when they recovered it so that they're hopeful about what they might be able to find uh, on his body. What I struggle with is I don't know how much physical evidence would have been on his body if we're talking about a shooting. Uh, his mother says that according to the autopsy report, it seems like it was about three feet away when he was shot. So quite honestly, the perpetrator might have not interacted or even touched Tony's body very much at all. Um, but I'm thankful that they are at least looking at this, that they're going through this. I mean, it's terrible to think of what a family must go through to know that a loved one is being exhumed for this purpose. But I know that his mother, she was very clear in the press conference. She really appreciates that they're finally taking the effort, that they're reopening the case, and this is going to help hopefully kick things into a new gear. The way she puts it, the original team that was working on this kind of said, well, let's just go ahead and let people think that he did kill himself. And then we'll kind of be talking to people underneath that and we'll, we'll find the truth through that. I don't know what type of approach that is. And maybe she's not understanding what their approach was properly, but uh, it, it doesn't sound like it would be very effective. And obviously we go through 15 years with no major development. So it seems like it's not effective. At this point, at least in the video, you can see that she is excited and appreciative that there are people that are finally listening, finally trying to help her with this. Um, and I'm really appreciative too, that they, they got a DA, a DA in there that was willing to do that. Becky Drumright said, the new investigation into her son's murder will be different than what police were able to do in 1999. They're investigating Facebook, she said. We've got so many other avenues to do from now on that we've never had in the past, and they're researching things that are being posted on Facebook, and several things have come up on that just in a day. We will find who did this. He's been gone 15 years. He was 15 years old, but they will find who murdered my son, Tony. Stowe said sometimes it's easier to investigate a cold case. Quote, folks that were in love may no longer be in love. Folks that were scared of someone, that person may have died or been put in prison. A lot of folks that could not talk 15 years ago may be able to talk today and may want for them to talk. He also said that their investigation will be just as intensive as if the homicide happened yesterday. And of course, they also note that there is no statute of limitations on murder cases. We get a little more detail about this case from the Jackson Sun. Um, they're talking about a 38 caliber handgun that was used in this crime. Now, honestly, I'm kind of surprised by that. Uh, initially, it sounded like it might have been like a 22 or something that was used in this, just considering the fact that there didn't appear to be an exit wound. Like I said, we don't really understand the logistics of what happened with the bullet. Um, the fact that he was still alive when they found him, it's just... I don't know, a 38 caliber handgun at three feet distance, I imagine that's going to do quite a bit of damage. And his mother just did not seem to see that type of damage uh, when she found him, but I'm not sure. Uh, here's another quote from her. Tony was shot at a distance from three feet. Uh, we know it was a homicide. We know he was murdered. Drumright said when Stowe called her to tell her that he wanted to exhume Drumright's body and open the cold case, she said she cried and thought, my God, someone is finally doing something. It was bittersweet, she said. It was a happy cry. Drumright said she hopes that this will also help the other cases get solved. Yeah, apparently there are 13 other unsolved homicides in Carroll County. Uh, quote, I don't want this to happen to anyone else's child. It's not about me. It's about our children, our grandchildren, our neighbors, our friends, our family, our loved ones. Very, very sweet. And you know what? It should be, how about just about her? I mean, with everything that she went through and for waiting that long for help to come, um, it just amazes me that she's even in that point of view where she's uh, trying to raise exposure through the tragedy that she has gone through to help other families as well. And 
that's something that amazes me about people that are put into these tragic situations that I see time and time again. It's almost like it's not enough for them to get their case solved. They want to also help other people that are in a similar situation because they really understand how those people feel. Uh, over at CrimeOnline.com, here is an article I mentioned earlier by Lee Egan, written on June 26th, 2018. And here's where we get a really interesting twist on a potential suspect. The only reason Drumright could think of as to why someone would kill her son was if he happened to see something he shouldn't have while out riding his four-wheel ATV. People who live nearby allegedly ran a methamphetamine lab from their home. Did Tony see illegal activities that prompted someone to kill him and keep him quiet? Pretty interesting theory. Uh, I'd be really curious for someone to ask her, did they notice if the four-wheel ATV, had it been moved? Did it seem like he had used it that day? Uh, I'd also be curious just to understand where her daughter was during this time. Uh, you know, her daughter might have been, it looks like she's a few years older than him. It's possible that she could have been, well, I guess she would have at least been in high school. Um, so, you know, it's possible that she had other activities that kept her away from home until later in the day or something along those lines. I struggle a little bit with this theory because if they were going there specifically to harm him, would they really go without a weapon and then find a weapon that's in the home, use that weapon and then leave it behind? That's, that's really just, once again, the sticking point in this case for me that I can't quite let go of. Let me tell you this. There were witnesses who saw who were on our property that day, Drumright told Nancy Grace. The TBI investigation of that is just incredible. They have never even questioned those witnesses. Let me just stop there for a second. That is kind of mind-blowing. I mean, for for her to, you know, talk to her neighbors and her neighbors are saying, "You know what? We did see someone that was on your property that day. We know that it's this specific person." Uh, I would think those leads should be investigated, but for some reason, TBI has opted not to. Now, admittedly, just because her neighbors could have seen someone coming on the property earlier in the day doesn't necessarily make that person, you know, the, the culprit right off the bat. But anyone that was near that area in around that day, I would even say, maybe not even on that exact day, should at least be interviewed. I mean, what if they saw something? What if they noticed something that's a part of this case? So kind of frustrating to hear that, at least from what she has heard, um, those people were never questioned. Back to her quote, I don't think there is a proper investigation. That's the first thing they should have done. Fast forward three years later, and authorities still haven't made any arrests. Now, at the end of the video um, that Dennis Ferrier made, he actually talks to DA Stowe about this. And the DA is pretty clear that uh, the exhumation did give them a few new clues, but obviously didn't give him enough to really lock in any type of conviction or press charges or anything like that because nothing has happened. Uh, so it's one of those things where I'm interested to know what those clues are. And he did say that they're still being followed up on or processed. Um, could one of those clues lead to a change in this case? I hope so. I don't know how much I would be waiting for that because now we're talking about three years after all that analysis has happened and we're still sitting here. So that's kind of why I'm hoping something like this video, other media exposure on this case can help uh, really get the right tip. I think they need new information in this case. They need someone that knows something about what's happened here to really step up and to do the right thing. So that's what I'm hoping for in, in doing this video. Tennessee Special Projects reporter at Fox 17, Dennis Ferrier, who covered the case heavily from day one, told Nancy Grace that, quote, there's nothing like a bad start to a case. And I have to agree with him. But I also want to just throw out that reminder that we're talking about a situation where this young man was not dead when he was found. And we had emergency services that came into the scene as well. Um, so I kind of understand a little bit about how a bad assumption could have happened, but I would like to think that the, the regular procedures and processes around this should account for this type of thing. I mean, what happens in other cases that are known homicides if 
a victim hasn't quite died yet? Does that mean that people just trample all over all over the evidence and let neighbors come by and help clean it up before it's been analyzed? It, it doesn't sound right to me. So it seems like, I don't know if something was missed. I don't know if there's a formal process of containment and control of a site like that. Um, but this bad assumption that he had done it to himself seems to really have thrown things into this bad start that Dennis is talking about here. We have more quotes from him. Even if you have suspects, where's the evidence? Where is the corroboration? The exhumation was not successful for obvious reasons, 15 years. I think we've definitely got suspects. We might even know who did it, but proving it beyond a reasonable doubt is probably out of the question or we'd already have an arrest. Uh, Nancy Grace replied to him, I don't know that anything is out of the question, especially in light of new DNA techniques, specifically the murder weapon. The 38 caliber weapon was found on the scene. Very few perpetrators think to wear gloves to load bullets into a gun. Very often fingerprints or partial prints can be found on those bullets. Not only that, when you touch DNA, there are so many alternatives. I think they meant when you consider touch DNA. Um, I don't know that I agree with an assumption that the culprit touched the bullets and loaded this weapon. Uh, I would believe it's probably more likely that this weapon could have been left loaded in the home if it is for home protection reasons. Um, so I don't, I just, I can't imagine a situation once again, where you've got some perpetrator coming into the house, doesn't know the layout, happens to find the weapon, happens to find where the bullets are stored, puts that together in the middle of, you know, this kid coming home or there being some type of chase where at least one gunshot happens in the house. They then go to the backyard where Tony is shot again. Um, the, the logistics of thinking that loading the gun is part of all that story just doesn't sound quite believable to me. Uh, unless we are talking about a situation where it's someone that was much more familiar with the home. Um, but even in that case, like just saying, if it was someone that possibly lived at the home and you found their prints or their DNA on the bullet, you're not going to be able to do anything with that because it was in their home. There's a very good chance that they would have been in, in contact with that item previously. So I don't know, but touch DNA in particular on the exterior of the weapon, I would be very, very curious to see some analysis on. Uh, and I do think there could be something fruitful that would come from an analysis like that. But ultimately, I just I think this thing's going to come down to uh, some type of confession that is needed, someone that overheard someone else talking about this crime, uh, the physical evidence in this situation. It's it's tough because it, once again, if we run down the the avenue of thought that we're talking about an intruder. That doesn't mean that only the backyard where they had to clean up what had happened to Tony uh, would be evidence. There would be other parts of the house, especially if you're considering the fact that this person was in the house, if they did fire that first shot that wound up in the wall. Um, there could be other areas where there were prints left behind or touch evidence. So I don't know. I'm just, I'm struggling with the logistics of this case on several fronts in case you guys uh, couldn't tell. There's one angle in terms of we don't have a whole lot of information. We can't really make a lot of very strong conclusions. There's another angle in terms of it seems like the initial investigation was just botched by this bad assumption that delayed them by a day. But even if they came a day la later and roped everything off, why would they have only processed the backyard? Uh, at that point, wouldn't they have figured out, oh, wait, there's another bullet that's inside the house. There's a window that's broken inside the house. The phone was off the hook, which all according to what Tony's mother said, her and the father figured out before they even found Tony. So at a minimum, assuming that emergency services came in and they were processing Tony, cops show up at the same time, wouldn't they at least talk to the father or the mother for a moment before they're off to the hospital and say, what's going on? And if they did, wouldn't the parents relay something happened in the house? We found a bullet in a wall. We found a broken window and the phone was off the hook in the back room. Wouldn't that be enough to start a criminal investigation in this case? How did that not happen? I don't know. 
It's really, really frustrating. Uh, other links that we have on this case, I do have a Web Sleuths thread, but it's literally only two posts. And I think I covered the articles that are uh, listed there with us. I will have, as I mentioned, a video to the press conference that was held uh, with Becky and DA Stowe uh, when he initially talks about it. Of course, I'll also have a link to the Nancy Grace podcast down below. And like I said, just jump in. I think it's about 30, 35 minutes and you'll get to where this case starts. And you can hear from Becky herself talking about this. Before we end today's episode, I also want to touch on something else that uh, I bumped into. This is a completely unrelated case, but it's a case that needs help. It's one of those where we have someone that seems to be a mystery hiker. We don't know who this person is. They've passed away and the authorities are looking for help. I was really moved to add this to this episode of Brain Scratch because when I went to the YouTube page um, where they've put out the information, the only known information about this guy trying to figure out who he is, I noticed that it only had two views. So I'm really hopeful that you Brain Scratchers out there will... Um, Sit, sit in for another few minutes and please uh, take a look at this case as well. And uh, maybe you know something about these items. Maybe you can help identify this person. This man was found in Canada, but uh, based on one of the items in particular, I'm thinking there's a possibility he might have been in California, but we'll get there. Uh, Ontario police are asking for help in solving the death of a man in 2016. He was found dead on the coast of Lake Superior near Montreal River Harbor. Police posted a YouTube video explaining what little details they know about him and asked the public for help identifying him. Now, what's interesting is uh, we don't even have a composite sketch or some, we have nothing in terms of what the guy looked like. All we have are personal items that were found with him. So let's watch this video together and maybe you recognize one of these pieces. The evidence suggests that he was carrying an elongated cardboard box which contained a rifle. The items recovered with him included. With the assistance of the Office of the Chief Coroner and Forensic Pathology Service, we were able to determine that the man was approximately 5 foot 3 inches tall to 5 foot 8 inches tall and was between the ages of 45 and 65. There is no foul play suspected in this case. So as you can see, uh, not a whole lot to go on, but I wanted to help raise exposure. I'll also have a link to this video in the description box below. Uh, if you guys could be so kind, please share that link. Let's try to help this video get viewed. I just, I, I can't believe that I found a news story on this and I linked to the video in the news story and the video literally has two views. Now, what's the piece of information that I think might be tying this to California? It goes with this hat. Um, now, I'm not the biggest NFL fan in the world, but I recognized that this was a logo and did a quick search on it. And here at shop.chargers.com, we can see that that is the logo for the now Los Angeles, formerly San Diego Chargers football team. As a matter of fact, I believe this version of the hat right here is the exact hat that is shown here. So I think this is an official licensed hat. Um, it's the men's new era Los Angeles Chargers uh, adjustable hat. So <sighs> kind of interesting that he was found in Canada uh, wearing a Chargers hat. Like I said, they're in LA now, but before that they were San Diego, primarily California-based team. Uh, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that he's from California, but... I, I think that there's there might be something strong to that. So uh, please keep that in mind as you're looking through these items. Maybe you recognize some part of what was in his personal effects, and maybe you can help them. Uh, I will have information in the description box below where you can email them if you do have any information on this case. That's it for this week's episode of Brain Scratch, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I really appreciate having you out there caring about these cases like I do. Have a wonderful weekend, take care, and I'll see you back here on Monday with an episode of Case Cracked. I don't think you want to miss this one. I'm really, really touched by it. It's, uh, it's a bit of a special story, so be sure to check it out. I'll see you here on Monday on the Lord and Arts channel.